let me begin with uh, three um, announcements. Uh, the first is uh, the PowerPoint slides will be posted this evening. Uh, secondly, a uh, reminder that papers are due in class, uh, hard copy, and you should just turn it in directly to your TA uh, on Monday morning. All right? Um, and yes. Sorry? No, you just, just bring in a copy, print out a copy, and give it into you. Yeah, because it, it, it's not really possible to read papers on the computer. Yeah, all right. Um, and uh, thirdly, uh, a reminder, as is mentioned in the syllabus, that there will be an extra class uh, on Saturday, not tomorrow, a week from tomorrow. And I'm going to give you a little more details about that later on. But it is mentioned in the syllabus, and I've mentioned it in class uh, before. Uh, and that's going to be at the Fowler Museum, which is, of course, on campus. I mean, for those of you who are new to campus, just look it up on the map, but it's only a few minutes walking distance from here. All right. Now, um, let me tell you what uh, we're going to do today. I'm, I want to sort of spend a little bit more time on India. I want to take up the story to 1857-58. Uh, so essentially keep in mind that many of the arguments that I'm advancing apropos of India are arguments that could be advanced apropos of other colonies as well. This is really a case study. We're obviously not looking at Algeria or Vietnam uh, or any of the other colonies in sub-Saharan Africa later on. I remember the colonization of Africa is going to take place uh, at a later time than was the case uh, with India or let's say with Indonesia under Dutch rule. Right? So we basically want to take the narrative up to 1858. I also want to look at a couple of text with you a little bit closely. Uh, and then I want to move on to the question of uh, the revolutions in Latin America very, very briefly. For those of you who are keeping up with the news, you know something's happening in Venezuela right at this moment. Uh, and it's really quite uncanny because essentially these stories get played out over and over again for the last 200 years uh, in a place like Latin America. Uh, but of course, I mean, this drive for independence uh, makes us reflect on what exactly is a nation, right? What is a nation? How is it different from a nation state? So that's what we're going to do today. Now, let me refresh your memory that in my concluding moments, what I'd done was I had, in my previous lecture, I had gone over this particular slide with you. I was describing the transformation of India under British rule, uh, military expansion, uh, the permanent settlement a system of rule of law, or at least that's what the British purported to have brought to India was a system of law, uh, a wholesale transformation of India is what we're really speaking about. Now, the question that arises is, how did the British hold on to India? It's a question that arises when we look at other colonies as well. I mean, and I've pointed your attention to that previously, right? That if you look at any one of these colonies, you'll find that the number of colonial troops was comparatively very small. And it's a question that ar arises also, of course, in slave colonies, uh, because the number of slaves usually outstripped the number of whites by a very substantial margin, as was the case in Haiti. So in order to understand that, we have to have some understanding of what I'm describing here as the pillars of British rule in India. And keep in mind, again, that this is a case study. So if you were looking at Indonesia, then we would be looking at the pillars of Indonesian rule, right, of Dutch rule in Indonesia. What, was, what were the various ways in which the, Indonesi the Indonesians felt susceptible to colonialism and became vulnerable? Um, and, so, and, and this is not, again, a, 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 you know, a detailed picture. It's not uh, very comprehensive, but it gives you an indication of some of the principal things that you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about how the British, who had come to India as traders, get transformed into rulers and then hold on to India for another 150, 175 years until India acquired independence in 1947. So number one, there was the rhetoric of fair play, the idea of rule of law and justice, right? In other words, the British claim that, look, before we came here, India was essentially a despotism right? Political despotism. And of course, the meaning of a despotism is that the life of no individual is secure in that state. The idea of private property doesn't exist because if you do have property, the despot can appropriate that property, right? And we know that one of the, one of the, one of the key 
aspects of the liberal dispensation of white U European slash Western democracies for the last 300 years has been the whole idea of private property. You go back to someone like John Locke, and of course it's a, it's a critical factor uh, in the American Declaration of Independence and the formation of the American Union, right? So the idea was that we're bringing the rule of law, which means that the law is blind, blind meaning that it is impartial, uh, and this is something that Indians have never witnessed before, and this is something that they're going to appreciate. Um, and notice, by the way, that Marx, uh, in his two articles, which are really staggeringly interesting, they're drawn from this little collection, the First Indian War of Independence. So Marx and Engels wrote not just those two little pieces in India that I've assigned to you, but they wrote a whole bunch of articles uh, on India. Uh, neither of them, of course, had gone to India, so they had to rely upon Reuters or news agencies of that time. Um, but even Marx holds to the view that India is basically a despotism and that what the British have introduced is some notion of what you might describe as a rule of law. Secondly, the British took the view that nothing excites a people as much or agitates a people as much as when they begin to think that a European power is meddling in their religious sentiments or their religious affairs. So the British took the view, by and large, at least until 1813, and here I cannot give you the particulars, uh, that's what I do in my course on the history of British India, uh, about why 1813 is crucial, but I can only tell you this, that the East India Company, which as you know is ruling India, they basically have a charter, and the charter comes up for rene renewal every, every so many years. Uh, and in the 1813 um, iteration of this exercise, uh, the British finally decided that they were going to actually remove some of the restraints they had placed on themselves. That is, that company would actually now begin to interfere in religious custom. Partially, the British thought that they could do this now is because, remember that the conquest of India took place in 1757, as I pointed out to you in my previous lecture. So now we're saying that another 55, 60 years have elapsed. The British are a lot more confident about what they're doing in India. Their, their territories have expanded. But until such time, and even after 1813, there is still quite a lot of dispute over this, the idea was that there would be no non-interference in the religious and social affairs of the natives. That they would not, for example, um, tinker with, so if you go further down, you see here, it says improvement, abolition of sati, right? So sati is the practice of widow immolation. Uh, this is something that takes place in one part of India, in Bengal principally. There's a very complicated set of arguments about what happened there. The incident is relatively small, but the British find it gruesome. What do I mean by widow emulation? That when a woman loses her husband, she sits in the funeral pyre along with him and burns herself to death, right? So that's called sati, the practice of widow emulation. Now the British say, so when we're looking at improvement now, this is now post-1813, post-1820s, in fact, the act for the abolition of sati is 1829, right? So at this point in time, the British are claiming that, look, we're actually here to improve the nation. We're here to improve you as a people because your morals have declined, right? And there are going to be, of course, some Indians, for example, those who are at the lower end of social life in India who are going to view British rule as a blessing because they're going to say that the British interference now allows us to overcome indigenous systems of hierarchy and oppression, all right? So this is what I mean by the whole ethos of improvement, and I'm saying that non-interference is important for the first 50, 60 years. Gradually, the British are going to begin to change their view, and they're going to start to actually intervene, and much of this intervention is in the name of improving the condition of girls and women. Why girls and women in particular? Because by the early 19th century, there was a view which was extremely widespread in Europe, at least in principle. And that view was you judge a civilization by how it treats its girls and women. You, you judge how advanced it is by whether women have access, for example, to 
education, whether, they, whether, you, whether the civilization gives them some notion of dignity, recognizes them as individuals, so forth and so on. Right? So many of the social reforms that the British are going to undertake are going to be undertaken in the name of improving the condition of girls and women. Never mind, by the way, the fact that in Britain, girls and had no access to education at all at the time that the British are making this claim. So you have to remember that. It's not like the condition of girls and women was fantastic and everything was hunky-dory back in England itself. Far from that, right? And just keep in mind the factory acts, 1833 and moving forward for the next 20, 30 years. You've got girls and women working in factories, you know, back in Britain itself, all right? And, of course, there were other pillars of British rule, such as indirect rule. That we're, we're going to basically, look, so long as we can have access to the revenues of the state, so long as we exercise political sovereignty, we're going to let Indians rule themselves in certain limited ways, and we're just going to simply supervise, as it were, right? And this is one way of understanding what I'm describing as indirect rule or limited native sovereignty. And remember the larger picture. The larger picture is I'm saying these were the various ways in which the British were able to consolidate their rule, make themselves acceptable to the Indians. And of course, one favorite strategy, this is the old argument, just because it's old doesn't mean it doesn't have merit. It does in this case, which is the British used, as every colonial power has always done, the strategy of divide and rule. You set Indians against each other. You use religion. You remind the Hindus that they're a group of people known as the Muslims and you have nothing in common with them. You remind the Muslims that they are Hindus and you have nothing in common with them. The Hindu loves to worship the cow, the Muslim loves to eat the cow, right? That would be the British way of setting these people against each other, so to speak. And then, of course, there's a whole question of what I have described as the conquest of knowledge. So this is what I described to you in my previous lecture when I showed you the three slides of all the interventions that the British introduced in the realm of knowledge. Because in order to know the native, to, conquer, to rule the native, you have to know the native, you don't. Know. I mean, there were, there were situations where the British think they're doing something good for the Indians, and they don't know that the Indians are talking to each other and basically cursing these guys, using four-letter words to describe, right? And so, of course, in order to overcome this kind of situation, what do you have to do? You have to be able to master the languages. And you have to be able to, and in order to know the Indian languages, you, think you have to create grammars and dictionaries, modern grammars and dictionaries, right? And this was partly the Enlightenment project, too that everything is knowable, everything is mappable. The entire world can actually be mapped, you know. And so the British are going to be engaged, as were the French. I mean, the, the, the French in uh, 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 conquest of North Africa and the Napoleonic project of creating a massive compendium of knowledge about North Africa is comparable to what the British were doing in India, right? And all of this, can be encapsulated under the word hegemony. That the British exercise hegemony. Hegemony is different than domination. A domination, domination is where Saddam Hussein, you know, and his henchmen basically are telling the Iraqis 25 years ago, well, you better vote for me. You know what percentage of the vote Saddam used to get whenever they used to have an election in Iraq? 99.8%, right? It's like Bangladesh today. I mean, if you, if you read the news, Bangladesh just went through an election and the, the ruling party got 98.35% of the total vote. Well, what kind of election is that, right? Because essentially it's understood, uh, if you don't vote, well, there may be consequences for you, right? In the US, you don't have to worry about that because you basically have one party masquerading as two for 200 years, so that's hegemony, you know? Right? So you think you have a great deal of choice because you can vote for a Republican or a Democrat, never mind they're all millionaires or billionaires if you're sitting in the Senate. That's hegemony. You don't need to have a gun on your head and say, hey, vote for me. All right? That's the simplest way in which you under can understand the idea of hegemony. That is, the British have to use powers of persuasion because how do you persuade? 
300 million people or 200 million people that we are here for your good, right? Never mind that the same people are thinking of all the Indians in completely racist terms, for example. Right? And it's in that context that you have to look at that document which has been assigned to you by Macaulay called Minute on Indian Education, 2nd February 1835. So who is Macaulay? Macaulay is an English official who's in India. He's a member of the, of the Council of the Governor General of India. Right? So there's a governor general, a British governor general, who is now ruling India, and he has a council or a cabinet. Right? And, and Macaulay is the legal member of that council. He's also a historian, by the way. He has a reputation as a historian, and he writes this minute. And this debate is called the Anglicist Orientalist Controversy, in which he inserts himself. What was this controversy? We need to understand that for just a moment before you can understand Macaulay's intervention, right? At this point in time, in the 1820s, 1830s, to reiterate what I've mentioned to you before, the British have consolidated the rule. Now the question is, how are they going to exercise their rule? So in the domain of education, there was a group of people among the British, they are called the Orientalists, all right? They are called the Orientalists. They take the view that the Indians should be educated in the classical languages of India. And the classical languages here would be Sanskrit for the Hindus and Arabic and Persian. As a, we, we won't get into the story because neither Arabic nor Persian are, of course, indigenous to India, but now they've been in India for a long period of time. And these are the languages with which, for example, Muslims are going to be educated, right? That all the money should be spent on these because these are the languages which have an honorable status among Indians. The Anglicist view is that these languages are, pardon the expression, but that's more or less what Macaulay says, a load of rubbish, right? If you've read the Minute on Education, remember what he says, that an entire set shelf of Sanskrit texts, an entire room actually, is not worth a single set of books written in English. Right? That these languages have not produced any knowledge that is worth the name. And particularly in a modern period, it would be criminal, Macaulay is going to argue, he's, so he's adopted the Anglicist view. Right? He wants to anglicize, if we may say. It would be criminal to actually use these languages because the real question that came up was the government has to now disperse a fund of money. How are they going to allocate the money? Should they allocate it to creating, right, uh, to, to supporting education in Sanskrit, Arabic, Persian, or should they use the money to actually educate Indians in the English language? And of course, Macaulay is looking at the long term because what is he saying? He's saying that, look, we have to reflect, at the, the British have to reflect upon the fact that we are in India now for the long term. And there are people like Macaulay, in fact, Winston Churchill, 100 years later, is still thinking of the long term. No one, no British is capable of thinking at this point that at some point we're going to lose India. Now, this is, of course, not on the horizon. They've just gained India. They've just consolidated the rule. And so, there, so Macaulay is saying that, look, let's also accept the reality that there are always going to be a small number of Englishmen in India. And so therefore, in order to rule this country, what we need to do is we need to create a class of Indians who are conversant in the English language, who feel like an Englishman, who think like an Englishman, right? They're going to be practically English, except in race and in color. We need to create this class of Indians. The only way we can do that is if we now introduce a modern system of education based on the use of the English language. And within that view, there are, by the way, there are splinter views within that orientalist view, because some Englishmen who agree with that view are going to say, well, you know what we really need to do is we need to create textbooks 
in modern Indian languages. Because the reality is that 200 million people or 100 million people are not going to learn English. It's a foreign language to them. Right? So therefore, we need to create modern knowledge in the Indian languages, in modern Indian languages, such as Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, Bengali, Oriya, Kannada, Tamil, so forth and so on. Right? That's, that's, that's another pr branch of what you might call the Orientalist view. There are also some Englishmen who are concerned what kind of books in English are we actually going to introduce the Indians to. So when one Englishman says Shakespeare, because after all, he is the bard of the English language, some other Englishmen say, no, 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 we can't use Shakespeare. Because after all, for those of you who read Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth, what are these plays? I mean, there's incest, there's murder, there's adultery. This is going to teach Indians bad things. So we can't use Shakespeare. There's a lot of other English literature, but not Shakespeare. Right? So there are debates of that kind. This is called the Anglicist, Orientalist controversy. And that's the intervention that McCulley makes. But keep in mind the larger argument. The larger argument, again, has to do with the whole idea that we need to be able to exercise a rule in such a way that we make it persuasive to Indians, that they buy into the colonial project, if I may use a colloquialism. All right? And that is what that document is really about. Now, while we're in the midst of this, I don't want you to forget for a moment that colonialism was not simply about all these things. I mean, from my point of view, the in intellectual conquest of knowledge is the fundamental thing. But the nuts and bolts of colonialism is the economic exploitation of a country. Right? And if you look at this little graph here, cotton textile trade between India and Britain, notice what happens. So 1757, the conquest, and then gradually the expansion of British rule. You have a famine I pointed out to you into the 1770s. And then late 1700s, permanent settlement, 1793, right? And then, as I pointed out in the, my, in the preceding 15 minutes, you know, a consolidation of British rule. Notice what happens, okay? The textile trade, see what happens. Britain is now going to export. India was renowned the world over for its textiles. And Britain is going to start exporting textiles to India. Because what's happening? They're going to take raw material from India, they're going to process it, and then they're going to send it back. Right? And of course, you can set up a system of tariffs and duties. So you make English products, you bring them in, there are no tariffs. But if you want to bring Indian finished products, not raw material, Indian finished textiles to Britain, then obviously you increase the tariffs. Right? So we shouldn't forget this part of the story when we're looking at it. And if you look at this, all of these slides will be made available to you this evening when I post them here. Imports of raw cotton. Right? So that's what I mean by the raw cotton. And then, of course, you've got the Industrial Revolution in Britain. You've got manufacturing um, industries. You've got, uh, obviously, mills. Uh, and you're going to now start producing manufactured clothing. Right? So here, here you have in the East India. East India means, of course, India, as opposed to the West Indies, which is the Caribbean. Right? Egypt, Brazil. And if you notice, of course, India was outstripping the import of cotton raw cotton into Britain from India outstripped every other country anyhow. But then if you see after 1863, do uh, you, you, you know why? By the way, it increases dramatically in 1863. If, sorry? Because you have a civil war in the United States. And the, the South, which was a cotton producing area, right? there's no cotton going from there. And so the raw cotton being imported from India increases dramatically, right? Really, as you can see from the tables over here, all right? So just keep in mind that aspect of the story. Now, switching back again to India and to um, what's going to transpire. So I have given you the scenario until the 1830s, 1840s, but there is growing resentment against British rule as well. 
And what you're going to have finally in 1857-58 is what is called the Great Mutiny. It used to be called the Sepoy Mutiny. Sepoy is a foot soldier. Okay, it's now usually referred to as the Great Indian Rebellion of 1857-58. There had been rebellions before, just as in the case of the Haitian Revolution. I pointed out to you that, well, this is, you know, this is what enters the history book in a limited way. It doesn't enter into most history books at all, but when it enters into the history book, you know, you hear about the Haitian Revolution, 1791, the declaration of Haiti as a free republic, uh, January 1804. Uh, but before that, there had been many slave rebellions. Now, similarly, in India, what you have is you have, obviously, a number of revolts against British rule. But th the biggest threat to British rule is going to be in 1857-58, when the entire country is going to be con convulsed. At least the northern portion of the country is going to be convulsed uh, by this conflict, which is going to be crushed by the British at substantial loss to their own lives as well, but it's really going to be crushed by the British with absolute ruthlessness. Um, and that's not because the British are particularly ruthless necessarily, but that's what you do when you crush a rebellion, all right? Um, and so when I say crush with absolute ruthlessness, what do I might mean by that? Give you an illustration. You capture an Indian rebel, and you know what they would do. And this is reported in American magazines. And sometimes they would, after they had captured these Indian rebels, they would tie them to the cannon, to artillery. Then they would fire the artillery. The body would just fly in, into the air and blow up into bits. Right? I mean, this is, this is how rebellions are crushed. Right? So there's going to be a rebellion of 1857-58, but we need to understand a little bit. And, I, and again, I know that this is, I'm repeating this yet again, that the same exercise can be done with respect to other rebellions. There may be other causes in other colonies. Right? So this is, this is not, there are things that are distinct to the Indian case, and then obviously we have to say that there were anti-colonial forms of resistance which were common in various ways across the Asia's and subsequently moving into the late 19th century and then the early 20th century into, into Africa, right? Um, and there was, there was a catalyst, which you can read about in the history books, which is always talked about. I mean, that's how we had learned history when I was growing up, that there was an immediate catalyst, that things had been you know, building up for this great rebellion, but then you always need a match to light the fire, so to speak. Uh, and that was when the British introduced these new, new rifles, uh, in order to fire these rifles, you had to chew off a bit of the cartridge. The cartridge uh, uh, had uh, either pork fat uh, or beef fat. If it was pork fat, it offended the Muslim soldiers. It if it was beef fat, of it offended the Hindu soldiers, right? That's, that's the catalyst. But, but the main things that I think we need to think about is increasing, increasing racial sentiment and divide. I, I mean, the, the, notion that, that the, the notion that the British had that they were vastly superior to the Indians, and you know, when you conquer a place, uh, such feelings of uh, racial hierarchy may not be entirely uncommon. Um, uh, of course, one could make the argument, which I will later on, when we look at the mid-19th century and, and Europe itself and European intellectual thought, uh, that the idea of race was a distinctly European idea. It was not an idea that other people had. Right? So increasing racial sentiment and divide, uh, politics of annexation, the British used various policies by which they continued to annex Indian territories. So for example, one of the, one of the uh, doctrines was what was called the doctrine of lapse. Doctrine of lapse. What is the doctrine of lapse? That if an Indian ruler, remember that British rule is growing gradually, right? They're absorbing more and more territories. They're wars of expansion. Wars of expansion, however, are expensive. You have to fund them. If you're going to send a military campaign, for example, they, they sent a whole army into Afghanistan in the 1840s. And guess how many British came back alive? One, to tell the story of how they got wiped out. Yeah? Um, if the Americans had read a little bit about that history uh, 20 years ago, they might have thought a little bit about going into Afghanistan. Yeah? And if the Soviets had read about it, they might have thought a little bit about going into Afghanistan. Right? But those are long stories, very long stories. Main thing is you cannot 
just have wars of expansion because that requires revenue, it creates unrest. So one of the ways in which they expanded was the doctrine of lapse. If an Indian ruler did not produce a male biological heir to the throne, that kingdom would cease to exist. Now Indians had a system of adoption. You could adopt a child. The British said, we're not going to recognize this. I'm simplifying it. Right? But that's, so the, the kingdom lapses. It ceases to exist. And it gets absorbed into British territories. Right? And then, of course, there was this whole question of offenses caused to the religious sentiments of Indians, which I've already spoken about. Right? So, so what's going to happen? Post-1858, the British are going to revert to the policy that they used to have before 1813. Don't interfere too much in the religious sentiments of the Indians. Right? It's like the American forces going into Iraq, for example, or Syria, or wherever the case might be saying, yeah, you know, we're only interested in the political question. We don't really want to meddle with the religious lives of Muslims. Right? Because, you know, if, if the Muslims feel that their religious sentiments are being offended, um, then it's going to become very difficult for us. Right? Now, British expansionist policies were certainly creating hardships. B the f extraction of revenue. If you're going to support that rule, you're going to if you're going to support a system of uh, wars, Afghanistan, Anglo-Burmese wars, they're called, right? Uh, the annexation of the Sikh kingdom, so forth and so on. Now, all of this is going to create substantial hardship because it means that they're going to have to increase the revenue base. And what you have is you have severe economic collapse, deindustrialization. I, I mean, one of the one of the most astonishing things that you have to think about is that in the course of the 19th century in Western Europe, and this is one way to understand the history of Western Europe in particular in the 19th century, moving into the 20th century, is over a period of time, the number of people who make their living from agriculture continues to decrease. In the United States, circa 1800, the vast majority of Americans would have been involved in agriculture. And do you know what percentage of the population of the United States makes its living from agriculture today? Less than 2%. It's 1.5% approximately. This number continues to decrease. In India, the percentage of people who made their living from agriculture increased under British rule throughout the 19th century. And this is one way of understanding deindustrialization. Whatever claims the British might have made about industrializing India, they don't really hold up. All right? And this is one reason why, among many others, you have a substantial migration, which I'm going to talk about when we look at the migration section. A substantial exodus of Indians from India. If you've ever been to the Caribbean, the British Caribbean, if you've ever been to Trinidad, or you, if you've ever been to Guyana, or if you've ever been to a very different part of the world, such as Mauritius or Fiji. And if you, if you have, you might have asked yourself, well, how come half the country is Indians? Well, that all goes back to the 19th century, when these Indians began to be taken, and many of them left. Some, were, some didn't leave voluntarily, some were taken. It's a complicated story. But this is what is called Indian indentured labor, and they began to work on sugar plantations in Trinidad, in Guyana, in Jamaica, in Barbados, Fiji, Natal. Natal is a province of South Africa, right? What becomes South Africa later on, and so on and so forth. Right? And of course, long story of famines, which I had hinted at before when I said that British rule was bookended by famines. So what you have is you have unrest in the countryside, you have you know, agrarian distress, and really, most importantly, in the general sense of the term, the total exclusion of Indians from the governance of their own country. I mean, if you're looking at the 1850s, were the Indians who, were, who had been taken under British administration of India and said, OK, you can help in governing your own country to some degree. No. They were completely excluded from the governance of their own country. And so, of course, you could say 
And it's a very complicated matter whether we should view the 1857-1858 revolt as a revolt of self-determination, because there are obviously complicated histories. Some, of peop some historians have argued that it had nothing to do with the idea of self-determination, really. This was just the distress that they felt, you know, that the peasants, these were isolated. Uh, but, they, but that's a long debate that we cannot really undertake here. What does remain true, unequivocally so, is the fact that Indians did not have a role in governing themselves. And then, as I said, the 1857-58 rebellion is going to be crushed. What are the consequences of that? The company is going to be abolished. The East India Company is going to be officially abolished. It has ceased to really be that important a player anyhow, because in India was increasingly be gov being governed by parliament from the 1800s on, right? But the company is still there, and so now India becomes what's called a crown colony. Um, and you can, uh, you can forget the second part here because it's going to take too long to get into that. Uh, for those of you, I mean, I'll put up the slide for those of you interested, and if you've read some history, you'll have some sense of what I really mean here. But there's going to be a change in the administ administrative structure of India, uh, and, uh, and uh, a, person called this, a person called the Viceroy, uh, is now going to govern India on behalf of the British Crown. Uh, they're going to have a cabinet position back in England itself. That person is called the Secretary of State for India. Um, uh, but those are official ways of thinking about what really happened in 1857-58. There are other ways in thinking about it. All right, And I want to dwell on one of these here, the re-territorialization re of Indian space. I want to just dwell on that for a couple of minutes because this is when I think history really starts to become interesting. I don't really care whether India was governed by a man called Viceroy or a jackass, if I may put it that way. I really don't care what you call him. But what is interesting is these kinds of changes that I want to describe to you. Now, when the British retook Delhi, Right? So if you look at a map of India, right over here, Delhi is in the north. It's the capital today, right? Now it's called New Delhi because the British eventually built a new capital around the old city of Delhi. So that's called New Delhi. All right? Delhi had been around for a long time, very, very long period of time, all right? centuries. Now, 1857, when the revolt takes place, the, the British are, so to speak, going to be expelled by the sepoys, by the mutineers or the rebels. There is still a, a person called the Mughal emperor. He's officially still ruling India, it's only in name, all right? And he sits in a palace called the Red Fort. He sits in the Red Fort. Now, when the British conquer Delhi again, they take it back from the rebels. The Mughal emperor was a Muslim, right? Because the Mughals were, were Muslims. They were adherents of Islam. So what, what did the British do when they stormed into the Red Fort and retook it? According to the official British historian, Right? This is not an Indian source. This is what the British historian of the mutiny himself says. He says that what they did was they drank wine and they ate pork. Okay? Now you think about it. Right? I mean, it, the, the, the equivalent would be that, you know, Islam takes over Israel, and the minute they take it over, they go into Jerusalem and they go into the most holy sites. Right? And they start doing things which would be the most abhorrent to the adherence of that faith. Right? In other words, if you want to humiliate a Muslim, eat pork, drink wine, all the things you're not supposed to do. So what are they doing? They're taking that space which and they are re-territorializing. They are claiming it as their own. They're stamping their, their presence on that territory. It is a symbolic recapturing of that territory. 
it's as though saying that now we have absorbed you once again, right? And uh, the other way to understand it is what I'm calling the desacralization. So you take a space that is, so, so to speak, sacred, and you make it profane. You make it profane, right? This is one of the ways in which the British, of course, not only sought revenge for the rebellion of 1857 to 58, but this is a way in which they sought to now re-transform -tran India once again, right? And so if you take a city such as Lucknow, what they do, Lucknow was one of the sites, it's, more, it's called, Ab the Abad is what you, if you're looking at the text, they'll talk about Abad, but what do they do? They take this old city and they kind of more or less level it. And the British had this view that, you know, look, if you go into these oriental cities, there are these narrow alleyways, you know, the orientals are drinking their tea and smoking their hookah and hatching plots against us. So let's level it. By the way, the, Brit the French did that in Paris. I mean, if you know the history of Paris, after the revolutions of, you know, the, the French Revolution and then the revolution of 1848, particularly the rebuilding of Paris, you build huge boulevards. And one of the reasons you do that is because then you can take troops down. And eventually, of course, in the 20th century, you can move tanks down these big boulevards. Have you ever been to one of these cities in the east, you know, with very narrow alleyways? You can't take tanks. You can't even take a, a small car through those streets. Right? So the idea was you retransform that space completely. Right? And these are some of the implications of the 1857-58 rebellion. They also reorganized the Indian army because when I called it a mutiny, there were the East India Company armies that soldiers who had fought in them had actually rebelled. So now the British were worried. How do we secure our rule in the future? And so one of the things they sought to do was to, as I said, reorganize this Indian army, all right? and so forth and so on. Well, we don't really have time to look at all of this over here. Uh, but, but if you look at the last portion over here, the expansion of the railway network, uh, one of the, this is important because, because of course the British were now looking for ways in which they could secure the country in the future and the railway network. So the railways were not introduced simply for the convenience of Indians. I mean, you know, that was, that was not what the British had in mind. Uh, they had various things in mind, but one of the principal things they had in mind was um, a modern system of conveying troops from one part of the country to another uh, to make it more effective, right? I want to br briefly, before I conclude this, I want to briefly consider Marx, right? Those two articles, which are uh, fabulous, fabulously irritating for me, as well, uh, given the point of view that he has, because if you've read them, they're both short pieces, five, six pages each, you might be thinking to yourself that this doesn't really sound like the Marx that you'd heard about, because after all, Marx was a great anti-colonial figure, wor workers of the world unite, right? Uh, let's just transform it into colored peoples of the world unite, no? No, no, what is he doing here? He's saying that, look, the British are despicable. Right? That, those are his words, vilest thoughts. He says that they were actuated by the vilest considerations. Right? If you look at, if you look at the, the last page of the first article, England, it is true, in causing a social revolution in Hindustan. Hindustan is India, right? literally the land of Hindus, was actuated only by the vilest interest. It's not like the British had noble intentions. Marx is not fooled into thinking that at all. He's quite clear in his mind. The British had these vilest interests. They're a despicable lot of people, frankly, and was stupid, his words, and was stupid in her manner of enforcing them. Enforcing them. But that is not the question. The question is, can mankind fulfill its destiny without a fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia? So what is it that Marx is really saying? So he's saying that, look, if you look at India, and of course you have to ask yourself, where did he get his ideas of India from? I can tell you where he got them from. He read all of these European writers who had been writing on India from the 17th century. 
right? And they had a certain conception that they had built up. For example, in India was a land of political despotism, right? Number two, just giving you some elements of that narrative, that there was no conception of private property in India. Number three, India was a collection of village communities. And it sounds very idyllic, little village communities, you know. And he says, no, 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 these village communities, they were cesspools of stupidity, ignorance, barbarism, superstition, right? You know, the most loathsome places that you can think of. That's, Marx is saying, that's India for you. Now the British, another barbaric, another form of barbarism. So it's one form of barbarism heaped upon another form of barbarism, right? Whatever that may mean, just imagine it. it sounds hellish, frankly, right? Because the B British are barbaric. They're vile, they're stupid, right? But what Marx is saying is that, look, and this is where you have to understand Marx's theory of history. The whole problematic of historical materialism, that countries have to go through stages before you can arrive at that utopia called a communist society, okay? And he has a fantastic description of that um, in another text uh, called the 1844 manuscripts, and then 1845, the G German ideology. And what is that utopia? The utopia is a person can be a fisherman in the morning, a hunter in the afternoon, a plumber in the late afternoon, and then in the evening, you can drink wine and sit and discuss. That's utopia. You can be everything you want to be. There's no specialization of labor, anything of that kind, right? That's the communist utopia. Before you can get there, you have to go through all the stages, which include industrial capitalism. So England, even though it is a vile country, and that the English are actuated not by the interest of Indians, it's not that they're motivated in coming to India because they are full of noble thoughts and sentiments, no. They've come there to exploit the country. But he's saying that unwittingly, so to speak, England becomes the agent of change in this country where nothing changes otherwise. Why, does, why did nothing ever change in India? Because what was the political structure of a country such as India? The political structure was, it's, it's a pyramid. So at the base you have tens of millions of masses toiling away, peasants, workers, whatever. What happens in a country like India? Timeless India, unchanging India. There's a guy at the top, he's called the despot. Every 20, 30 years, his head gets knocked off, another despot comes in his place, then he gets knocked off, and now the British are the despotic, they have come, but they are different than the previous despots because they are the agent of a true social revolution. Because they themselves have undergone industrial capitalism in England, right? So to recapitulate the argument that the British are an agent of social revolution in a country that has previously never known what revolution means. There was no possibility of a social revolution in India because India was vegetating in the teeth of time. It's like, you know, that patient you've heard about, you know, somewhere in, you know, who's been in a coma for 30 years, right? So India has been in a country that's been in a coma for centuries, and now the British have come, and they have unwittingly caused a social revolution, right? Which is one reason why this great champion of human equality can say, well, Despicable as the British are, maybe it's not such a bad idea that they're in India, right? This is what he's fundamentally arguing, all right? And it's very important you understand that argument because of course there is a whole theory of history, a whole theory of social change, you know, what is called historical materialism, which is crucial to that.
well, we'll have to stop there. Um, and in my next lecture, I will take up the question of a nation, uh, revolutions in Latin America very briefly, and then we'll move on to the next segment.